I'm Dan Drake. This is Front Up on Visitor Network TV. Our guest today is John Merson, a local uh, contractor and uh, a resident of Baxter Road in Sconset on the Bluff. And his house is about six or seven houses down from where the main erosion activity has been, although I guess you've had your share too. Uh, we haven't had that much, mm -hmm. but we've only been there for 10 years. Mm -hmm. We've only owned the property for 10 years. We haven't seen that much erosion. Mm -hmm. It's generally a good deal farther up. Mm -hmm. But, I mean, like six houses, right? Seven houses? A little more than that. Uh, okay. We're at 71, where Bayberry comes into right. Baxter, yeah. and the worst erosion is in the 80s. Right. But that, I, uh, that one house, it was just two houses were just moved back up there. It's 81 and 79? Yes, uh, actually. actually um, four houses uh, adjacent to ours mm -hmm. have all been moved back in the last few years. Okay. And we moved ours back 100 feet mm -hmm. uh, five years ago. Uh, we decided when we bought the property 10 years ago that we needed to do that. So how do you feel about the efforts to uh, impede erosion on the bluff out in Wisconsin? Well, I think the people working on it are well-intentioned and they're smart people. Mm -hmm. They're my neighbors. Mm -hmm. I, I know most of them particularly Josh, I think he's doing a good job. But I think there uh, are some unintended consequences of what they're doing that maybe haven't been mm -hmm. fully appreciated. That is, efforts to stop erosion in one place tend to cause greater erosion mm -hmm. in places nearby, up and down the beach, and that very often leads to litigation between neighbors and even without litigation, the kind of disputes that can result can really cause a fracturing in the community. Mm -hmm. And that, I think, is a greater danger, particularly since this kind of project is going to be contemplated on an island-wide basis. Um, Do you really think so? Well, I think... Who's going to pay for that? <laughs> well, you know, the real costs are the cost of maintaining it. Right. And that's going to be paid by the local taxpayers in each case. The uh, tax consequences of this haven't been figured out or announced yet. To but, but for the Wisconsin Beach Preservation Project, the taxpayers aren't paying for the maintenance for it for at least some period of time. We have to assume that within the next few years, local mm -hmm. taxpayers in that area are going to be asked to pick up the cost of maintaining mm -hmm. it. And as, you know, if you talk to the folks in Situate, and they've had the most experience mm -hmm. with this, one of their um, selectmen has said, if somebody gave this to you free, the real costs of maintaining it are going to dwarf the capital cost of building it mm -hmm. uh, within not too many years. Here on Nantucket, we also have to worry about where's the sand going to come from? This takes a phenomenal amount of sand. Mm -hmm. And essentially, we're asking the town of Nantucket, ultimately, to take on the burden of doing this. This isn't something our town government is really equipped for. Well, first of all, on the sand issue, Josh Posner said there was at least 20 years supply. 20 that, years isn't very long yeah. when you think of uh, the lifetime mm -hmm. of our kids and their kids uh, and the life of this island. And they're certainly also talking uh, as if this is not going to become a taxpayer-funded project anytime soon. It's a different definition of taxpayer. What they mean um, is that the general taxpayer isn't going to pick up the bill. The affected taxpayer, through a betterment tax, which would be added to people's property taxes, is going to be impacted mm -hmm. and is going to be expected to pay all the costs of this thing. Now, that's a good thing, in a way, because it means the people who believe they're going to benefit from this mm -hmm. are the ones who are going to pick up the bill. But if you think about this spreading to the North Shore and Madigat and other places on the island that could be impacted by beach erosion, then we can really foresee a day when the, almost every taxpayer on Nantucket is to some extent mm -hmm. affected. What about the idea of, of you know, that's been around for a few years now of, of uh, sinking things like old railroad cars? in the ocean rather than rather than working with the beach itself. I think it's a very interesting idea. I'm not an expert. Mm -hmm. I'm not a coastal geologist. That's the sort of mm -hmm. person who would really right. understand mm -hmm. the consequences of doing that. But when you think about it, that was the original 
one of the original proposals from the beach fund. Mm -hmm. They were saying, let's take sand from offshore and use it to nourish the beach. Well, they would have been taking away one of the very natural. No, but I'm talking about putting man-made man man objects out there in the in the water itself. It's just not my expertise. Yeah. Uh, but I'm surprised that that hasn't been studied because um, it seems that that offshore sandbar is one of the things that dampens the wave energy mm -hmm. of waves hitting the eastern shore mm -hmm. of Nantucket. Uh, is that something that's been talked about out there in Sconset? It you know? really hasn't been. It came up in the context of Madiket and the, and the sheep pond area, I know. It really depends on where the wave energy mm. is coming from. Most of our wave energy is moving sand up and down the beach, which is why sometimes we lose beachfront in Codfish Park and gain it elsewhere and vice versa. Mm -hmm. Over the last 20 years, we've gained quite a bit of additional beachfront in Codfish Park. And that wasn't something that was predicted. And of course, before that, you lost a lot. In Absolutely, Park, yeah. yes. Um, the, I mean, there, it seems to me now the efforts around the island are, are in some cases non-existent, really, in Madiket and Sheep Pond area. On the North Shore and the Dionys area, they're being done by the homeowners on an individual basis. Um, and then you have the Sconset Beach effort. Yes. Um, does it make sense to have something, a group other than the CONCOM, which is worried about a whole lot of different things, uh, just, just focus on the beaches and whether there is a way to, to preserve them without hurting your neighbors and, um, you know, be in charge of the permitting process and so forth for these rather than, than um, a group which has many other things on its uh, plate. I, I understand your concern about this thing, but the CONCOM uh, appointed by the Board of mm -hmm. Selectmen is really the key body that's charged with enforcing our wetlands protection bylaws. Mm -hmm. And we have a stricter wetlands protection bylaw on Nantucket than any other place in the state. And I think that's really appropriate because the beach is really central to our economy today. We're a tourism-based mm -hmm. economy. Anything that hurts the beach is likely to hurt generations of Nantucketers in the tourism business, in the construction business, and in our general infrastructure activities. Mm -hmm. So I think a group appointed by the Board of Selectmen is really exactly the right group. I'm not suggesting it shouldn't be done the same way, but I'm saying it should, uh, and this is just sort of an idea. Yes. That should there be a group that instead of worrying about ponds and, and wetlands and marshes and uh, all those things, which are very important, and I'm not downgrading them in any respect, it just focuses on beach efforts because some of them get under the radar, some of them are done under the radar. And um, it, if one group is just focusing on that rather than having to, to look in all directions at every corner, yes. it might make a difference, I think. I don't know. It's certainly possible. Um, I suppose the, the other side of it is that it can be co-opted. <laughs> <laughs> the Conservation Commission took a long time to work its mm. way through the various applications mm. submitted by the Beach Fund. But uh, one of the reasons was during that process, and I attended many of those mm. meetings, um, the uh, Beach Fund's lawyer would frequently ask for a delay. I need more time mm. to submit data. I need more time to gather information mm -hmm. to respond to your questions. So what could have been a much more compressed truncated process ended up taking five months right. just to turn down this uh, permit mm -hmm. for the geotubes. But the, it, you know, it's fundamentally a political process. We're trying to balance different things. On the one hand, we have the need to protect houses. On the other hand, we have the need to protect the beach and wildlife and the other, you know, natural parts of Nantucket. And how do you balance those against each other? Mm -hmm. The folks on the North Shore um, 
built their uh, initial rock revetment before the Wetlands Protection Act was enacted. So they're grandfathered in. Mm -hmm. they, they never really had to go through um, a CONCOM review but process. But I presume they would if, it ever, if they ever tried to re, rebuild it because in the places where it's falling down. Or to extend it. Mm -hmm. And uh, so if they want to extend that, and as I'm sure you know, it's caused quite a bit of scouring at the ends and um, up and downstream from uh, where they mm -hmm. built the revetment. So at some point, I could envision neighbors coming in and saying, look, we're being harmed by this. Would the Conservation Commission, based on new information, review the damage mm -hmm. that's been done? But you also have the people further west of Dianus Beach, yes. that being to the east of Dianus Beach, the one we were, I think you're referring to. Yes. Uh, who are doing their own efforts with either dune rebuilding or with some kind of barrier yes. that have been taken out time and time again right. uh, by the winter storms. And, you know, again, back to this issue of, of the jurisdiction of the CONCOM, the, uh, the last few houses that have been built just up to the 40th pole area have been built right on the edge of, the technical edge of the dune. Yes. So, over time, I think we're going to see a shift in the way we um, define what's a desirable location. Mm -hmm. It used to be that the closer you were to the water, the cl closer your access to the beach, the more desirable mm -hmm. that location was. Mm -hmm. I think in the future, people are gonna say, you know, being close to the water is not an unmixed blessing. Maybe it's better if we're a little farther away. And I think inland locations and higher locations uh, are going to be seen mm -hmm. as more valuable. So who knows? That's uh, a process, I think, that's underway. Um, it's interesting, too, the si fallout. And you mentioned some of that earlier. Um, what I believe is a piece of the um, fabric from Gene Ratner's Yes. Barriers washed onto the beach in Matic in the last couple of days after all these years. Yes. And I have a picture of it, actually, that I took. Uh, so there is a, you know, it's amazing how the consequences of these things keep going. Cause it's for been, long after. For long after, yeah. Well, you know, as a former foot soldier um, who travels back to mm. Vietnam frequently, mm. I can tell you we're still um, trying to clean up the damage that was done in Quang Tri province mm. by all these unexploded artillery shells. And you know, we people, have that problem out at the airport too. Yes. <laughs> and people uh, who fish for a living are saying they're occasionally getting their propellers uh, fouled mm -hmm. by some of this material. So these things have consequences that extend far beyond when the work is done. Mm -hmm. And I think the job of a the CONCOM and, of course, the Board of Selectmen is to try to think through and anticipate as many of these long-term consequences mm -hmm. as possible. Um, one of the theories that was cited for why the CONCOM uh, denied the permit for the, the la latest GO2 permit was, and I haven't been able to verify this clearly, but it's been mentioned to me a couple of times, that the town seems to have backed off somewhat from its position. Maybe it hasn't taken a formal vote on it, but just seems gradually to have eased away from its position in support of that effort. Do you have any sense of that? I don't sense that that was a factor in the CONCOM's decision making. You know, once we appoint these bodies here on island, mm -hmm. they become um, stubbornly independent. <laughs> they have a mission that's mm -hmm. based in law and mm -hmm. regulations. Um, there are people appointed to pursue and protect mm -hmm. that mission. Mm -hmm. And so it's sort of, um, they can be very independent mm -hmm. of the group that hired them, mm -hmm. appointed them, as long as they think they're pursuing their mission. I never heard that come up mm -hmm. in their deliberations. Um, of course, some of their deliberations are in private, but from the questions they asked, you could see that they were trying to balance off, well, what can be done to protect those pre-1978 houses versus what's the harm going to be? Mm -hmm. 
And so I saw their deliberations as being all about how do we honestly protect the mission that we're here to protect. Any other consequences that you see f flowing out of this? You're still talking with your neighbors, I gather. <laughs> I, I get along with my neighbors. Um, I, I like them as mm. people, and I think, as I said, I think they're well-intentioned mm. and smart people. It's a question of how you balance things. When I see my neighbors uh, moving their houses back from the edge of the bluff, um, I applaud them for it. Mm -hmm. I, I did the same thing, and I think in the long run that's the best solution. Um, what worries me most is we're a small community, and if we get this kind of fracturing of our consensus about how to protect the beach, the things that matter to us most, um, then I think we can lose our sense of community, and that's what worries me ultimately. Mm -hmm. Thank you for your comments, John. It's very interesting in your perspective. Thank you for having me here.